morning, Rod. How are you? I'm a little bit of a cold, so forgive me if I'm a little croaky on the phone. Yeah, it's like kind of freezing cold here in California, but for those who are in the east, you know, we don't really know what uh, cold is, but uh, <laughs> it's, oh, it's really cold. But uh, in any event, Rod, I, I, I have to say to the group as, as we're moving into the session, you are truly one of the, the people in, in the industry that I really respect. I appreciate our friendship and that you're taking the time uh, to share this stuff that ties into your business, but it also ties into life and the uh, uh, impact that we can have away from the office. So thank you so much for that. Well, I appreciate that, Jeff. I feel a little uncomfortable hearing comments like that. Sometimes it's hard to take those kind of compliments, but I appreciate it, Jeff, and I appreciate people giving up a few minutes of their day to spend it with me today, and hopefully they get a little something of value out of it. Right, right. It's going to be great. Well, before we get started in the content, I do want to thank our title sponsors for Success Tracks. There, there's a few great companies that really grasp what we're doing with um, free promo tips, and uh, and those companies are Snugs USA, Warwick, and and AIA, and it's with their support we do all these. Uh, success track sessions and we've had some amazing content and more great content like what we're doing today is coming up and for this session we want to thank uh, ETS they uh, are, are a great drinkware supplier and one of Rod's preferred suppliers and uh, and I, I want to add when I was up <clears throat> this past year for the made-to-order 10th anniversary ETS was one of your preferred suppliers Rod do you want to comment a little bit about uh, how you value those supplier relationships and all, and, and also I do see that uh, Tom from uh, 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 hit senior <laughs> well, Tom uh, was also there. So you want to just comment a little bit on on how, your positioning and your relationship with suppliers and how important that is to your business. Well, it's critical. I mean, we share part. We share our clients. They're not our clients. They're not our suppliers' clients. We share them together and. Without you know terrific communication and and great you know great service and terrific safe products, you know we're really screwed and we've got to have great partners uh, relationships that go that go on and on and and we can mutually deliver a value to our clients because our clients will throw us both out if we don't deliver good good product and safe product. Right, right, yeah. That we need our supplier partners. So I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to you, uh, Rod, and then you can go ahead and, and we can get into uh, some of this content. I'd like to talk a little bit, by the way, do you have that now where you could show your screen? Should be up now. Okay, there we go. You know, you know so I'm just going to let you sort of take it and, uh, and uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, one of the questions I have is so you're a successful guy. I've you know been your business. You know Barbara has made a, a great dinner. You know you 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 know you're really blessed in many ways. And so you you leave the comforts of your home to go to Africa and Mexico to build houses. So tell us a little bit about about that. How it is that you are able to do that, and and perhaps some folks can learn about your business positioning. Uh, uh, how you make that stuff happen away from the office as well? Well, what I want to, what I'll try and do is, I, is try and offer a little bit of instruction, maybe hopefully a tiny bit of inspiration, you know, an invitation for us to connect and talk at any point in time. I'm happy to take anybody's phone calls or emails at any point in time, and then a little bit of a confession is that I never think of myself as being successful, and never think of myself as really understanding or knowing what I'm doing. I just kind of go through life trying to pick good partners from my wife to my work coworkers to my vendors. So. Really, I, I just rely on my network to try and get me through. So again, a little bit of instruction on kind of how I've organized the business and how I take my, my time off, and then the inspiration in terms of what I do with my time and an invitation to talk, and then finally that confession. So it's not a particularly organized talk, and I encourage anybody that, if the, and I'm not sure, the Mr. Moderator, how you want to handle it, but if they want to stop and ask questions anywhere along the way, I'm happy to do it. But really what I'm going to do is a little bit of grandma's slideshow, and it may be just killer boring to look through a bunch of slides, but I'm going to try and give you some quick visuals of what I do with my time off, talk to you about how I got that time off and why I do the things that I do with my time, 
But the first thing I want to do is just kind of show you a little bit of a story of, uh, of the, the, the last couple of trips to Africa. I've been to Africa three times and Mexico five. So here are some images of the youth. We take uh, four adult leaders with us, and I take a, a dozen or up to uh, 14 high school juniors and seniors with me to Africa. Again, been a number of times here from the local high school. Uh, I'm in the front of the picture there with my son behind me. And it's a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to go to Africa. We visit the countries of Malawi, Lesotho, and uh, Zambia uh, uh, on our trips there. And we coordinate through, we have a sister church relationship in Africa. Here are some of the church elders and my adult partner and her daughter meeting with the church elders. This is to give you an idea of the youth sitting in the pews at the church when we arrive there. And again, up on stage with some of the elders, I'm an honorary elder of Kafita Church in Lalongwe, Malawi. Hey, hey by the oh, way, Rod, nice yeah. tie there. I mean, I, I love that. You know, that was, My, it's pretty, yeah. pr pretty, pretty stylish. And and if anybody has any questions, you can type those into your question box, and we'll we'll get to those uh, either midway or, or at the end. So uh, uh, yeah. you do have that opportunity. That'd be great. Thanks. So again, it's just giving you an idea of the church. The church actually has 7,000 members, and they have probably 19 different choirs. They're singing all the time. It's really the music in Malawi is absolutely fabulous. It's a cash economy, so I kind of thought this was a fun picture to take of you. This is my youth. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> and so we have yeah. to get, we have to take tens of thousands of dollars of cash. And the exchange rate is about, I don't know, a million to one or something incredible. So these bills, you have handfuls of bills that we have to use for everything that we do when we're traveling. So we have just incredible quantities of money. So our first stop on the, is, a, is an orphanage there because there's a 27% HIV infection rate in parts of Lalongwe, and, and indeed it's over 20-some percent in Malawi in general. There's a tremendous amount of orphans, and the orphans used to be absorbed by the greater family structure. They would be taken in by aunts and uncles and in-laws and what have you, but the absorption is just impossible with so many, so there's a huge number of orphans over there. So one of our first stops is an orphanage, and we take buckets and bags, hundreds and hundreds of tennis balls over there because the balls are light and unbreakable and easy to carry, and it's just a fabulous toy to give out at these orphanages when we go around. And so you can see all the kids with their tennis balls there, and we would play games with them all day long. Here's some more of the orphans riding around on on our backs. You know, the girls would get these babies, and the babies are craving uh, affection, so they would pick them up, and they just they would just fall asleep on them, and they just would would not want to ever leave. They just don't get much affection or motherly love in these orphanages. So we do the best we can. We just spend the whole day there playing with the kids and. And uh, some of them are pretty, pretty rugged shape, um, but we just have a really good time working with the kids and playing with them the whole time in the orphanages there. So that was one of our first stops in that orphanage there. Um, this little girl couldn't walk and couldn't speak, um, but mm. I just carried her around with me on my shoulders all the time, all day long. It was just really a fun little one to, to hang around with. We taught them how to knit, so that's what we're actually doing here is knitting. Um, you know, knitting, it's actually a hand-eye coordination thing, helps them with their fine motor skills. And we took over bags of yarn and knitting needles and then taught them how to knit. And it didn't really even matter what you're knitting. It's just the idea that you're you're working on your fine motor skills and uh, working on your hand and eye coordination and trying to teach them any kind of a skill that we can. So that's what we're doing there with the knitting. My son playing with some of the kids. Our next stop was a feeding station, and when I say a feeding station, we literally take an oil drum like this and mix up hundreds of pounds of cornmeal mush on an open fire, and then we try and feed all these kids. These kids just come out of the woodwork. Um, we sponsor a feeding station there that, that feeds them um, uh, three times a week. We make a meal out in the big open area uh, and buy the cornmeal and stir it up with basically what is a canoe paddle over an open fire and try and feed as many of the kids as we can. We stand them up in line with the smallest ones in the front of the line and the tallest ones in the back, and we try and feed as many of them as we possibly can. And that's uh, those plates you know, these, of food um, right there. Go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, these these pictures of of these children and um, 
like if you I don't know, can you go back to that one with the boys there? I mean I hey Which Tim, one here. You know, I mean this isn't this like like when you look at their faces and and they're close, I mean, doesn't this really speak to what these conditions are there? I mean, these children, I mean, I know they're really happy when they, they see you and you have a positive impact, but wow. I mean, this to me is a very striking kind of photo. Yeah, I mean, there are hundreds of them here, and they're lovely children, and they're all uh, you know, just, just wonderful little kids, but, the, you know, they're just in desperate conditions, and uh, food is very hard to Hard by. life. You know, the interesting thing, Jeff, is I will tell you is that they're mostly very happy. You know, they just, they, they really are to a large degree happy. Now, they've got to get fed, and we've got to try and do what we can for them. But um, they're very joyful, laughing, playing kids. They're really wonderful kids, and I've got some more in my story later on. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Wow, but, amazing. Um, yeah, you can see the little distended tummy. You know, a lot of times hunger gives them a, a distended belly. So we do what mm. we can to try and feed the kids. Like I said, this plate of food here will feed about, oh, probably five or six of them will share that plate of food. A little bit of chopped greens and some cornmeal mush. And, um, you know, that's really all we can do when we're there at that, that time. But it's a great experience for my children and our youth to go in there who are kind of worried about their if they don't have the newest iPhone or, you know, a cool car to drive around to go in there and then have to feed these kids and realize, um, you know, how great their life is. I always think that the, wow. the decay rate of the exposure of the trip, you know, they're in Africa for three weeks and then they come home and they're back immersed in their own circles and friends, but a little tiny bit of the experience will stay with them for, you know, hopefully years to come and they'll be somewhat more appreciative and, and exhibit some greater gratitude for what they have in their lives. Then our next stop here is visiting a hospital. The, the hospital is a turn of the century sort of uh, leftover missionary hospital. This one happens to be operated by the Episcopalian, um, sorry, the Presbyterian Church. That's my youth pastor out in front of the of the hospital, one of the hospital buildings there. And this is Dr. David Morton. David Morton's from Seattle. He's been four years at this hospital. He spent 12 years at a precursor hospital <laughs> in Angola. And when I meet people like this who have dedicated their whole lives to, to uh, saving lives, um, you know, lives in pretty desperate conditions. He is incredibly grateful for the opportunity that he's had to practice what he calls real medicine and to influence change and save lives. And they constantly are running out of medicine. They run out of fuel for their generators. They have any number of problems. But he, he expresses his deep gratitude that he gets to save lives every day and practice medicine um, in a way that's not concerned about insurance, it's not concerned about being sued for malpractice. He just really does exactly what he wants to do, and that's to practice medicine. So this is one of the churches, uh, sorry, one of the hospitals that um, I have the information for, and, and we set up an alternate gift fund and, and send money to this church, I'm sorry, to this hospital. So, right there. So let, let's talk about this for a second. So here's a doctor from Seattle. Now, is he yep. here full-time serving? He's, he lives there full-time with his wife. Their, their okay. kids are now so, grown, and uh, wow. he lives there. And so people who medicine. have – yeah, he, so he left his practice, you know, to go do this because this is a, a passion that he has. I mean, it's, a, you know, fascinating to me. I mean, we, we leave our – our business lives and in our world. And, you know, we, you know, we think we have it tough when there's, you know, the economy, we've gone through some you know, interesting times and, and here, uh, this is why this type of session is, is so interesting to me because uh, I think there's a value sometimes to stepping outside of our, our crazy insane lives and, and giving back in whatever ways we can. Obviously this person's, this doctor has dedicated his life and you dedicate the, the time, the two, three weeks, you know, to do that. And, and uh, it, it, I, I think it's healthy for your business and your mind as, as well. Just because uh, I think it's really good for your business. And in, in Jeff, you know, I've talked about this a little bit before, but I think it helps you stress test your business. Are you really building a business mm -hmm. Or are you building a, per, a cult of personality? That is, is, it, is your business entirely you, <laughs> or are you really building a business that, that can go on? And one of the ways to sort of stress test the business is to say, do you have 
teammates and infrastructure and and systems set up that you can step out for a week or two or three and it's not that I'm completely incommunicado, but boy, you can imagine in the darkest of Africa that it's not real fast to respond to every single email or phone call. It can be hours or days before you get a chance to respond. So it is really an interesting thing to sort of stress test your business and get away for a while. And when I mean get away, I mean really get away. The other thing is, is that I find it very healthy to go and talk to individuals like this that can cast off everything, really and say, I can survive on my skills, and I can both not only survive, but I can read a rich life, uh, and I can do things that I'm passionate about and enjoy doing. And forgive me, my bit of a bit of a cold here. I apologize for that. I'm kind of doing the no best problem. I can. Um, but, but for me to meet and interact and spend time with guys like David Morton is actually a really good business lesson in that sometimes you have to just breathe a little bit. Three days before I left on this particular trip, I thought, I'm going to cancel. I can't go. I cannot get away from my business. We had made a very difficult acquisition, very involved transaction, a lot of money on the line, and I'm literally freaking out. And I just, I think, okay, I just can't go. There's no way I can go to Africa and be out of touch <laughs> right. for three yeah. weeks. It's just not going to happen. The whole thing's going to collapse. I'm going to be bankrupt. I'm going to be in trouble. It's all over, right? I can't get away. And then, uh, you know, I just went into myself a little bit, spent some time with my wife, talked about it, and I knew I had made a commitment to my son, and my family is paramount in my life. And I said, I have to go. I just have to go, and whatever comes, comes. And we will deal with it. And luckily, I have some terrific, terrific business partners that could handle it <laughs> excuse me, while I left and went on this trip. And I'm so glad I did, because it does allow you, again, to understand that you can actually step away. It's not easy, but you can do it. So I'm going to move on now. Right. Um, there's a question I want to uh, bring up here, but uh, also, I mean, this whole idea, of course, a lot of distributors, you know, they're small, you know, one-man operations and, or person's operations, so it's a little harder. But I still think to some level you can, uh, uh, you know, work, work, work through that. Uh, really amazing. Now, a question came in. Uh, can you speak to how this has influenced some of the other kids that have traveled with you? Uh, obviously, there's high school kids there, their outlooks, career choices. What kind of impact do you see and feel with the American kids? That's a great question. Well, <laughs> I think that really in many ways the good we do <clears throat> is very fleeting for the people that we visit, feeding a few meals in Malawi. We do what we can, but I, I'm under no illusion that I'm sort of changing the needle on global hunger uh, in any way, shape, or form. Where I am moving the needle is with my own kids and with the kids that I take with me from Africa. Again, these are very impressionable kids, really making important decisions about their careers. They're 17 and 18 years old. They're juniors and seniors in high school. They're trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Who am I going to be? I took my older son four years ago to Africa, and we spent time at these hospitals and in these rural feeding stations uh, and orphanages. And for whatever reason now, he the light has gone off for him, and what he has determined that he wants to do is he wants to go into medicine, he wants to be a doctor. And so I have a son who's graduating with a degree in biology and another degree in uh, public health, and he wants to apply to med school and he wants to be a doctor. And I really believe that very much of that came out of his exposure when we went and studied medicine and these hospitals in, in, the, in, in Africa is where the light went off for him. I think that we have an opportunity, again, to make similar impressions, not necessarily that it would determine what they're going to do with their lives, but it will make them think about what they can do with their lives and what their obligation to the greater world is with their lives. So the, the impact on the children, like I said, may have a pretty significant decay rate when they get home, but the, the, the olfactory senses, the smell senses, is the, is the sense that has the longest, greatest retention of any of your your senses, oversight, or hearing, or taste, smell is the one that lasts the longest. And I like to think mm. that some of the smell will stay with them for a while, and that that they will recall from time to time of what it was like to be in 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 these countries where people have nothing, and what is their obligation to the greater sense of humanity in the world. Uh, 
Um, so I, you know, I really do hope that it makes an impact on them. I know it's made a huge impact on me. You know, I, I laugh sometimes. Wow. I look at this picture here. I'll tell you, Jeff, this picture here. You can see me. I've got on a mask here, and I'm mopping up. You know, this is a hospital that we're in, right? And so the whole team has got mops and buckets, and you probably can't even see that mop, but it's a stick with torn up T-shirts on the end of it. That's the mop. Jeez. And trying to clean up just some of the smell, you know, the the dirt and the urine and the blood and what have you, you know, doing what we can to try and clean up this hospital. And there's there's my son with a bucket there and me in the background. And there's a whole bunch of the girls working in this in this hospital, doing the best we can to clean it up. And then I'm donating blood here. <laughs> but I laugh when I see a picture wow. like like this one in particular here. You could not. I, I make a decent living, Jeff. I actually do, you know, and I run a pretty <laughs> yeah. good sized company. And you couldn't pay me to do this work. Not in a million years could you pay me to do this. You couldn't pay me five hundred dollars wow. an hour, frankly, to do this, you know. But I'll do it for free. And that's a really interesting thing about donating your time and your energy. And and did we do a whole lot of good here? I'm not sure. It's probably just filthy again within a week. But at least people saw us trying to clean it up and try to do what we can and seeing us get out of our skin and do other things to be appreciative of really what do we have in life. Right? So that's really the point of that. And then overcoming fear. People said, oh, my God, you donate blood in Africa. Aren't you afraid of AIDS? Yeah, the country's got a 27% HIV infection rate. I'm scared to death. But you know what that also means? It means that they're desperate for clean blood. They are absolutely desperate. That blood that I donated that day was used in a surgery that same day to save somebody's life. And how many times do you wow. get a chance to save a life in, in that same day? I mean, how many chances do you get to do that? And is it a risk? I'm sure it is. I did the best I can to assess the cleanliness, the sterileness. I observed everything in the pack. We have, I talked to David Morton about it. He assured me everything was good. And I said, I'm going for it, right? And here we're sorting out x-rays in the x-ray room. And then the next day at the hospital, my son and I and, and all the kids were able to load into these ambulances here. And we go out from the hospital, out to the rural villages, maybe an hour's drive, 45-minute drive out into the rural villages where they can't necessarily get to the hospital easily. And this particular stop was for newborns. So all the babies that are born are brought in on their mom's back, the, the new villages. They know we're coming. Here we are handing out tennis balls again to all the kids. But you can see the babies strapped on the backs of the kids. We hang a scale up in a tree that you can't hard to see, but that orange rope is holding a, a scale in the tree. And we weigh the kids. And we write it down in their little hands, their little passbook. They have a little health passport. And then we take them over and we, uh, we, we send them over to this station here. And here we're recording the weight and the size of the, of the child and how old they are. And then we send them to one of three or four different stations. Here we're measuring the size of the child. So we measure... The, the weight and size and, and graft them to see if they're malnourished, uh, if they're undersized. Uh, and the little pink book is their little medical passport book. There's the one of the volunteers from the, or one of the trained um, volunteers from the hospital, one of the Africans, um, writing down everything in the book here. There's their little health passport that the mother keeps. There's no record keeping at all by the government. Everything is kept in this passbook by the mom. Um, the Presbyterian mission developed this health passport, had these printed up, and taught the mothers that they need to keep these. And, and every time they bring their babies in, it's a record of what um, health services we could deliver to the babies. My son's writing down in there whether they, they need a diphtheria shot or a, tet or a um, polio vaccine. Did they get A or B polio vaccine? What's their weight? Measure, measuring them up. If they're malnourished, we give them four kilograms of super cereal. Cereal. This is super cereal. This is all donated and paid for by the Gates Foundation through the World Food Program. Hmm. And you can see babies with babies on their backs. I mean, some of these moms are 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, they're all lined up, given the tennis balls. And there's the, the faces of the little babies here. 
here's sort of the city, just to give you a little idea of what sort of the, the some of the city view looks like. And then the nicer houses are behind sort of the gates, the more affluent people in the cities instead of in the villages. Hmm. Again, um, at one of the orphanages there, riding around in the Jeep. Uh, here at one of the orphanages, we built a chicken coop. We used some new materials that we could buy and some we just um, recycled out of what they had kind of on site, used whatever scraps we could, combined with new materials, and we built a chicken coop. And this uh, this orphanage here is where we built the chicken coop so that they could have um, um, fresh, uh, fresh eggs every day and protein. We took a three-day um, side trip in the middle of the three weeks to take the kids to a game park, and these are all the hippos when we're crossing the river. Wow. We're crossing the river here in the game park. You can see all the hippos in the background. I just, I had to show you this picture because it was kind of like a Indiana Jones picture here. So we're, yeah, we're going wow. across this river full of crocodiles and and hippopotamuses and who knows what else to go to the game park to go see the lions and uh, and giraffes and elephants. And you have to pull yourself across here. So my son's is a rower, and I got a kick out of taking a picture of him because we, we call this euphemistically rowing across the river. He's actually pulling on a cable there, so we sent that to his rowing coach and um, just as sort of a gag and shot. And then in the these are the Maasai uh, warriors up in the north part. Uh, Maasai are a very different uh, breed of people, and actually very very happy people. They can't believe that you're so unlucky as to not be a Maasai. Every night, not every night, but most nights, we would get together with the youth, and the youth had raised about twelve or fifteen thousand dollars from car washes, garage sales, selling stock in the trip, hitting up parents and aunts and uncles and everybody that they can. For a year, they'd been raising money to take to Africa, and they would sit around and we would have a little powwow, and they would decide at each of the orphanages or the feeding stations or wherever it is that we were visiting the hospitals how much of that kitty they would give away. So they'd, they'd say, oh, we're going to give $500 away, $1,000, whatever it was, and, and we would um, and then deliver that money to each of the stops that we were. But the kids made all the decisions. It was their money, and they had to discuss the relative merits of where the money was going and defend their positions. And the adults were just there as sort of mediators, but we did not get a vote in where the money went. So it's all the children deciding what they want to do with their money. While they were on the trip. So, so in a way that, in a way that's kind of a business lesson of you know working, working together and d determining what's best in a way. Well, the other thing right? that was, was a really interesting lesson because we talked about the efficiency of giving. Yeah, you know, I'm just showing you some pictures here, and I'll talk about the. These are just some of the people. I took 50 soccer balls over there with me because it deflated the soccer balls, and with one soccer ball, I could make 10 or 15 kids happy. So I took 50 soccer balls uh, from one of my uh, suppliers over there and just gave them away everywhere we went. We gave away soccer balls. I'm putting in some sort of joke pictures here, but they had this long way golf club that thing was and, and campground. I mean, it was the most miserable, wretched place you'd ever seen in your life. It's kind of left over from the colonial British rule. It's completely overgrown, but I just thought it was kind of funny to have this picture of the long way golf club. Members only. Yeah, there you go. You know, you're high Here, end, we ran high out of fuel. Golf club. Uh, coming back from one of the hospitals, we ran out of fuel on our bus, and we had to buy it on the black market because all the gas stations were completely out of fuel. So we ended up buying five gallons on the black market just by sort of going, stopping in this village and just going around the best we could saying, has anybody got any fuel, anybody got any fuel? And some guy had five gallons of fuel that we could buy at an exorbitant price. And so... You know, we bought the fuel on the black market, which is also a really interesting um, sort of uh, sort of an exchange. We always figure that you go into a gas station, they got gas. Well, there you go to a gas station, they may or may not have it that day. So fuel um, is very scarce. Very uh, scarce and very expensive. They, yeah. Wow. Just some of the faces of the people, um, some of the workers, they were uh, actually here, they're cutting uh, wood for uh, construction, and that's how they... They cut the wood, and it was just amazing to watch these guys cutting the wood like that, just sawing uh, uh, big, long pieces of wood down there. And then some of the faces of the of the kids. This is a strange picture, but it's very fuzzy, and I'm sorry about that. But it's a picture of my younger, my sorry, my older son 
and my wife, and I had taken this on one of the trips five or six years ago, four years ago, I guess it was, and it was sitting in the in one of the pastor's homes, the picture that I had taken over there four years ago, and I was just touched by it, so I took a photograph of it um, to bring back, because here it is four years later, and you still got a picture that I had brought over four years ago when I took my uh, my older son with me. Um, playing soccer. It really speaks local you. It really speaks. Yeah, it really speaks. Of course, Rod, to the impact that these this short period of time has on these people's lives. Yeah. That they would remember that and treasure it. Really. <laughs> I'm going quickly um, through these. Just uh, I'm worried about boring you to death. But this is at a a blind deaf orphanage. Blind. De- I'm sorry. Blind orphanage and school. Um, and it just, it's hard to see the, 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 maybe you get a little bit of idea of the, the sort of thoughtful look on Vicky, my partner Vicky's face, and, and on my face, I'm holding up little tiny dice, if you would, that are braille dice, and so they have braille characters on six sides, you have to reach down into a little bowl, pull out, find the dice that you want with the letter you want, and press it into a piece of paper. So it can take you like five or ten minutes to write your name. Um, by by just pressing this new piece of paper, and the chalkboard in the background. We're in the teachers' room here. That's the lesson board for the for the month, the whole sort of what they're going to be teaching and where they're what classrooms they're in and what have you. And I was just an amazing, uh, thoughtful picture. And most of or about a quarter or so of the the blind orphans are also albinos. And these are the ones that really tugged at my heart more than anything else. Um, and so I had taken a bunch of made-to-order hats over there because the sun will eat them alive. You know, you can imagine being in sub-equatorial Africa and being an albino. <clears throat> and because the um, albino gene and the blind gene are so closely uh, genetically related, you, you get a lot of albinos that are blind and they are ostracized in the sort of the witch doctor mentality in the rural villages. They are really pushed out of the rural villages many times. So even if they're not literally orphaned, they are figuratively orphaned, and they end up in this this orphanage here. And so this is a wow. an orphanage that's particularly close to my heart, and I raised money for and sent Braille paper over there to them a number of years ago. And we took a bunch of leftover T-shirts. <laughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> and these hats over to them. But the thing that I always talk about is that how can you get a whole lot lower on the human food chain than being a blind orphan albino oh. in in the sort of the second lowest GDP in the entire you know world, and you're still laughing oh. and singing and playing grab ass with your friends. And I'm thinking whatever that is that they have run into their system. I want some of that into my my system because I can be very unappreciative that I'm not running some billion dollar enterprise or you know or buying the newest turbo Carrera Porsche. And then I think, wow, are you kidding me? I could be a blind albino orphan in sub equatorial Africa. So I find it amazingly, you know, healthy to um go here and see these kids. Look at the smile on the kids' face. I'm, I shot all these pictures wow. later, so it's not particularly brilliant photography. And then here's the at the feeding station where you're shucking the corn, and then we grind the corn and cook it in that, um, and over these big open fires, and we just make up as much of the the meal as we can on these open fires. And look at the smoke that you're you're living in there. You're cooking up this this mush, and it takes hours to cook it. Um, and then more at another feeding station, you know, lining the kids up and doing what we can to feed as many of them as as is possible. Um, I'm back with my little girl that I carried around on my shoulders all, all along and building our chicken wow. coop here. So then we put the chickens in there, and the first, very first day we had 18 eggs the next day. Here's a little more of the teaching them how to knit pictures in our chicken coop. And 17 of us packed in that little van right there. 17, I kid you not, with maybe oh, wow. a 1,000 pounds of luggage tied on the top. I mean, it is tight going over to some of these pretty – tough roads. I love this picture because the guy got all dressed up at this orphanage that we went to and the Aww. orphanage was paired up with um, uh, widows because the widows need the need to take care of the orphans and the orphans uh, give the widows a lot of love and so a lot of the orphanages are both widows and orphans together 
<clears throat> and you can see the little guy in the middle put on his best oh. tie for us to show up. And I just thought that was a brilliant oh. photograph, the little guy with his wow. with his tie on there. And here we're making mm. mud bricks with them at that um with the widows and the orphans, just casting these mud bricks to dry out the sun. You know, so here we are uh, getting dirty. This is a an orphanage and school that we visited. So that's the classroom there in the school. And one of the little youngsters, that, you know, it's both an orphanage and a school. So there's just me with one of the little youngsters I just hung on to all day long there. Um, it's very dark. Mm. You know, you you don't get an idea, it, it, but it, it's pretty dark inside that that school. And then here are the lessons on the wall, and this just tugs at my heart as well. They have no paper, they have a chalkboard, but they don't have any chalk, and they're just trying to memorize these things. So here's a flower, a duck, a dress, a leaf. You know, I mean, this is the lessons that are on the board to give you an idea of how destitute that school is, and they're doing whatever they can to try and teach the kids. So. That's what they have. There's their chalkboard, but no chalk. Um, and then I went up in the mountains one day and visited some of the sheep herders. This boy's this boy's like 25 years old. He's up there all day long, every day up in the mountains. It's freezing cold, by the way. It's winter time down in Africa, and this is up in the mountains of Lesotho. And uh, he saw me hiking up there with a bunch of the other kids, and just started yelling and running down because he doesn't see many people hiking up in the mountains. And and you know he knew a few words of English and a few hand gestures and we just kind of did what we could and communicated. But I just enjoyed uh, that opportunity to sort of interact with him out in the mountains so on a, on a Sunday afternoon after church. We were just on a little hike and an adventure. Um, and there I am up in the mountains and I love that picture. It just shows that the mountains and the sky just goes on and on and on forever. And the sheep herders are up there in the mountains. So. Wow. And then, really, that's the last and closing slide there. That's just my little girl that I had on my shoulders all the time around, but it, it, it goes to the issue of it. So um, I'll give you a couple of things just in closing, and that is that, you know, when you, you know, what what you can do with your free time is more than just free time. And the work that you do in life is more than work that you do for money. I think that we all have an obligation to work on behalf of, you know, our, our humanity and, and on each other. And so this has been a part of my work experience um, as well is that I feel an obligation to my partners. I feel an obligation to the people that, that are on our staff and work for us to make sure that they get time off, uh, to make sure that they are you know, in, in an environment of, of mutual caring and respect. And I challenge anybody to you know, through their business and, and, and to, to exhibit some of the same, um, I don't know, qualities of humanity, if you would, and then to do other work outside of your work for money, that the world needs workers of all kinds. Um, and I get a tremendous amount out of um, doing this kind of work. I, I didn't show any of the pictures of Mexico, but I love going down and building houses in Mexico every Springtime, I've done that five times. I'm going to. Go, I'm looking forward to doing it again this year. Um, it's just a, a, a terrific feeling that that um, that I can do work with my hands and I can do work to make a difference in somebody else's life, other than just uh, making money. So that's really the end of what I've got to talk about. I'm happy to take any questions, and I hope that somebody got something of value out of the the, the talk today. And I really I probably did not stress enough how it impacts my vision of delivering value to customers and but but I think that if you're a person that looks to deliver value everywhere in the world then customers will get a read on that and they'll want to do business with you so that's it Jeff um, I'm done unless there's any questions well uh, you know I don't have a, a webcam on me but uh, and we've done many of these uh, success tracks online learning experiences and uh, not uh, you know it's, all respect to all the great presentations you ha had, uh, nothing has floored me quite like this um, because uh, uh, it's it's really eye-opening and uh, to see this and to see that uh, that there are people like you and I know you, you you don't say you know you're great or anything like that, but there are other people, even these high school kids, you know, that are willing to take time. Uh, to go do this, I mean, it's just, um, just fascinating to me. I mean, it's 
you know, it's, it's inspirational and, and uh, you know, that you do that. And, and I, I've done a little bit of stuff. I've been down to Mexico, but not, nothing like this. I guess I'm perhaps too much of a, a brat uh, uh, to, to do this. But, wow, it's, you know, I've just been floored looking at these pictures and, and uh, really, really quite amazing. Uh, there are a, a few questions coming in. Now, when you're away, you alluded to this a little bit. Do you have any contact with your business? Probably not so much because – no, I mean I do. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, a cellular addict and an email addict as much as anybody is, you know. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've, I've got battery packs and backup batteries and power converters, and you know, I, I have a, I, I take an iPad with me. I will do whatever I can at hotels to try and get a little bit of an internet hotspot. If we, you know, with hotels is a euphemistic question. I mean, some of the hotels we stayed at had no <laughs> running yeah. water and no electricity, but, but I would try and find either, maybe an internet cafe or something and, and get get online. I mean, I definitely am an addict, so I would try and stay in touch. But there were sometimes 48 hours where I could not do anything except get a text message. Texts you can pretty much do anywhere. Mm. Um, even if you can't get on the phone or you can't get email, I can I could always get a text message. Um, and and so I would definitely stay in touch as much as as is possible, um, but Africa is very very tough. Uh, Mexico and Europe are you know pretty darn easy, but Africa is very tough. So you, you definitely get away. Wow, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, can we and, open it up on the phone, Jeff? Does anybody ask a question? Um, I don't phone? know. You know, maybe maybe we we could. I, I'll go through the ones that we have okay. here, and then we'll 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 try that. So. Is your tolerance for petty everyday problems in business and life altered by this experience? I, I speak for myself. It's like, oh my God, things are, are bad. You know, um, it's I, I gotta imagine this is fairly life changing and in, in putting your business challenges in perspective. When we talk about life changing, <clears throat> I think it's really important that it's not like you know you're, you're you're going 90 miles an hour in this direction. You make a hard right turn. You know, or, or you know, and go completely in another direction. When I think about life changing, I think that a, a that that work like this and trips like this and involvement like this do alter course by a half a degree or a quarter of a degree. You know, your trajectory is is 90 degrees now. Maybe it's 89 degrees. You know, you just you just all it alters a little bit. It's not like life changing in terms of you know a lightning bolt life changing, but it does help you to be slightly better perspective and and does it does it do I get through all the the little everyday issues that just make me want to break a telephone or or you know go have a, a cocktail at two o'clock in the afternoon no you know I still have those issues all the time I get really pissed off at stuff but at every once in a while you catch your breath and you think oh you are so lucky you know, and mm. and it it may be rare, but the more that I do this, the more that I have those moments that go, take a breath. You are so lucky. And and have gratitude and display gratitude. So I think it is helpful in that regard. But it's not like taking some magic pill that this is going to make you feel, you know, 100% different overnight. It won't. But it will alter y the long term trajectory of your life. And I and in there I find it valuable, and if it can alter the long term trajectory of the lives of my children, then so much the better. Yeah, great for the kids. Now, clearly, this is this idea of you going away serving, and we didn't even touch on the idea that you you do take away some time in the summer, and this is really based on your management style of your business and and how your team is trained, you know, to, to handle this because I, I believe that this made to order business model which is completely different from many large companies uh so how is it that your you know your management style uh i, I don't know you can answer that any way you want I and mean, were you driven to set it up this way or what are there any tips that you could pass along to others who kind of might see wow this is pretty cool i don't know how i could do that but you know what well for, first off you that? can't do it overnight you know, I'm 59 mm -hmm. years old. I've been I've been in the promotional products business for let's see, 35 years now, 34 years. 
So you can't do it overnight. It's not something you just do immediately, right? But you can set the course for it. And part of that is that, again, if you want to build an enterprise, you want to build a business, then you better you better use. Uh, you know, I I happen to to uh, have use equities and have shareholders in the company. I don't own made to order. I own a significant chunk of made to order. My wife and I own uh, you know a quarter of the company. Um, and I run the company, and I'm a lender to the company, but I have shared the success of the company with a number of my really key partners who have huge vested interest in making sure that we have a good firm that is an ongoing firm, a financially stable firm, that works well for, for hopefully most of the partners. Is it a perfect model? No, it's not. It has its flaws. We have all kinds of issues. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking I've got to do something better or different or, oh, my God, I'm, I'm going to be bankrupt again. Uh, you know, I still have all those demons. But, but the key thing is, is that I have partners. Right? I have a lot of partners that also own a chunk of the company. And when we all own it together, then everybody is looking out for each other and looking out for each other's clients and looking out for our employees at some level, some more than others, but but to a large degree, that shared ownership makes for uh, a, a company that has greater, hopefully greater stability um, than, than, you know, a hierarchy does. And I hope that answers the, the, the question. Right. And... And I've had the privilege to be around, uh, you know, some of some of your people. And uh, when we were up visiting for the uh, your tenth year anniversary, and you really have some amazing people, and and have created a company that is is unique in its business structure. And I, I think clearly the way they handle clients and respect mm -hmm. vendors, um, it, you know, it, it brings to mind when uh, Tom, who's who's in the, the session. Uh, from hit really, uh, you know, almost broke into tears as, as I was with, with this whole partnership relationship and the idea that you want to, you know, pay, pay people right and respect them. And, and so a successful business is really based on the partnership with our, uh, our supplier uh, partners, our service provider partners, our team members, our employees, in your case, actual partners of the company. Uh, I, I think that, it, it is something, though, that starts top down, but when we look at the success of what you've had, and I know you don't like to play up on that, you know, made to order is a player that's not only a solid business, but I think a respected business, and there's certainly something to be said for for that, and, and those who, who are in this session now or, or watch it live, you know, may take a look and go, wow. <laughs> you know, I've never, I've never heard of such, you know, it's not typical, uh, Rod, uh, that a business operates in, in this way, is it? I mean, well, you and you, you know, know I, I really don't know. And <clears throat> like I said, <clears throat> you know, we're always trying to to reinvent it and, and try and improve on it. We don't think for a second that we're we're successful. Frankly, we we just think that it's a work in progress, and we're just trying all the time to to try new ideas and and make it make it better and make it work for everybody. You know, we have a saying here that that life crashes into work sometimes so we're trying to always figure out okay how can we be <laughs> malleable in such a way to help any of our partners out that wherever you know circumstances change and, and you know what can we do to make sure that work uh, adapts to their to their needs and their changes and at the same time charge everybody with we have a responsibility to make sure that we have a profitable business that can reinvest in the in the needs of our clients you know, so we got to make sure that we're profitable, um, and we have to make sure that we we take care of uh, everybody that we can. And well, I don't have and, a and I don't have an easy soundbite answer on it. I believe that if you if you were to really nut it net it down, is that a shared ownership is is a good model, and then there's a lot of you know work to be done from there. But I think that that is a good model a business to deliver value to everybody, that is clients, employees, shareholders. Right. So they can't um, allow you to have so a real you're... life outside of work. Right, exactly. And I think that that's something that we all need to 
uh, take away from from this and just in, in life is uh, and, and I being a workaholic, I, you know, I, I I take this to heart myself and and. Uh, fortunately, I love what I do, and I have, uh, in addition to my distributor business, have the opportunity through Free Promotives to to be available and help other people as as I've been helped. I, I don't think I all that brilliant or anything, but I have a heart heart to serve and think that there's a uh, value to stepping outside our crazy lives and and being available. Jeff, I'm concerned um, about people's times, and they do have to do their real job. So unless there's any other questions, I right. think we would probably cut uh, it off. One last. Y- there is one last thing, and yep. we are under an hour, so, so I really appreciate everybody's time. And again, this will be recorded. But uh, before we wrap up, so have you considered a donation program for industry pens, paper balls, you know, blankets, sanitizers? Um, I know you serve on the PPA board, and that seems like a logical marriage to create. Is that is that more, something more than PPI or would want to take on, or what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, <clears throat> one of the things is that the logistics is absolutely impossible. So when mm. we travel, I travel what's called a missionary fair overseas. I get to carry two 70-pound bags with me. And so when, on the team goes, we pack one bag of personal stuff and one bag of uh, stuff that we're going to carry, medical supplies, tennis balls, locker balls, whatever we can carry over there. But you really can't ship anything. It just The infrastructure mm. you know, is just so different. There's no UPS delivering these rural villages and stuff. So we hand carry everything we can, and then we, we, we go back to the money that we were talking about with the kids. We look when we're visiting on site, who do we really believe is doing good stuff with the money, and we give them cash. Are they efficient? Is it bleeding off? Is it lining the pockets of the people that are there? Is it really getting into the hands of the needy? And in some cases, rather than cash, we will buy food for like the feeding stations. We don't give them money. We go out and buy the food, load it in the truck, and take it to the feeding station. So donations in kind can be very, very difficult. I mean, one time I took thousands of pens over there thinking I was going to give these to all the school kids. Well, it turns out the school has no paper, so the pens really don't oh. do them any good. Right? You know, it's really interesting the problems that you run into when you bring, you know, United States mentality over to a country like this. You, know, you saw the school board. You saw the school there. So taking all those pens over there <laughs> excuse me, was actually worthless because they had no paper. So you have to be a little bit careful on that. So logistics is a problem. Donations in kind can be difficult. Um, uh, it's not impossible, but it can be very difficult. Uh, so, you know, it's not an easy answer on that. Right, and in order to give food, you really need to be there, or it's just money because you have to go actually buy the, the food. Well, and, and even then, the money is when we're on site, we're being very observant, very careful. Uh, David right, Morton's operation at the hospital, right. I feel very good about the money and where it's going, and he'll be buying vaccines for it. Um, wow. Some of the, the organizations, like if I were at one of the uh, orphanages, to just give them money to the orphan directors, I'm not sure that would be a really good use of the money. because I'm, I'm not convinced that it would all get down to the orphans to where it needed to go. So you have to be very careful and observant when you're over there as to what you're going to be doing. Right. Okay. Well, that's that's interesting. Well, okay, so in wrapping this up, I do want to thank again the Free Promotive Success Tracks title sponsors, uh, Snugs USA, Warwick Publishing, and AIA, the um, big supporters, and, and also, uh, in this case, your preferred supplier, um, ETS Express, um, for su- uh, supporting what it is we're trying to do and getting out unique education that, you know, this kind of thing isn't typically uh, talked about. And, and I, it's been really inspirational for me. I think it's a great, uh, it's great to be able to do things that are a little out of the box like that in addition to t- traditional uh, business topics. So, Rod, you had mentioned, and I do know this, that as busy as you are, uh, you do make yourself a- available to people. If people yeah, w- want to pick up the phone and call you, me, how, how would they do? Okay, call and me, how would me an email. that number? I'm, I'm, uh, my office number is 925-484-0600, and I am at extension 113. That's extension 113. Or if find, find me on the web, madeorder.com. You can find me on the web. I am literally happy to take anybody's phone call and, and or an email and talk to them about this subject or any others. You know, I, I just I enjoy right. uh, a chance to sort of share some of these ideas with whoever wants to wants to listen. 
Okay. Right. And and the email address is Rod dot Brown at Maydaughter dot com. Rod dot Brown at Maydaughter dot com. All right. And I can say that you know Rod is uh, <laughs> truly a, a good friend that that has made himself available to to me and others and in in helping and and uh, so I really appreciate your time, uh, Rod, and also the time of all the people who are in the session. Uh, again, thanks thanks very much, and I'll look forward to connecting you with you at the uh, PPI Expo. It's going to be great. And uh, all you folks uh, in the session, uh, make it a great day. Thanks, Rod. Bye, guys.